If you've been using social media at all, using hashtag DSW16, please uh, reach out to our sponsors and give them some love as well. They are as follows. Chase, Downtown Dallas, Inc., uh, Red Bull and Kime Bar. Somebody told me they were sponsoring us that as well, so be sure to thank them. Uh, you've got Vela Wood, Touch Titans, Dev Mountain, uh, Circus, Kredos, and many, many more. And thanks to Chase for uh, sponsoring this location for free for us today. And now I'll turn it over to John Lindsay, the legal track leader. Here you go, John. Thank you. So as he mentioned, I am the uh, legal track leader, and part of the goal was to, of course, deliver informative and valuable information in the legal field to you guys. So I see a couple of attendees from uh, my patent presentation yesterday. Uh, we also had trademark yesterday, so a couple of aspects of intellectual property. We had uh, software licensing, which is heavily intellectual uh, property based as well, too. And so to round out the intellectual property series of presentations, we're going to have Marcus here. And so uh, some of you that saw uh, my presentation yesterday and you saw that, uh, you know, my technical background and we went through some of the elements of a patent application and described the value. Well, one of the aspects that I stated is that a patent application doesn't literally describe every single aspect of your technology. It's just enough to inform someone that's in the field, and then they can go and perform their own research and uh, round out the technology. Well, that uh, performing all that additional research takes time and money, and effectively what that means is that's value. That's uh, added value to your business, and effectively that is one of the categories of trade secrets, and so that's why I thought it would be valuable to have that in the presentation, and that's why I asked Marcus to, uh, to present on trade secrets. So with that, we're going to hear from uh, Marcus on trade secrets. Thank you, John. Good early evening, everybody. I know that I am uh, the startup act for the happy hour, so... I appreciate you guys coming out here today. Um, I'm an intellectual property attorney. I help businesses, startups, entrepreneurs uh, secure, protect, and maintain their intellectual property assets. Uh, as John was saying, one of those property assets could be a patent, one could be a trademark, copyright. But one of the lesser known, lesser understood uh, uh, intellectual property types is a trade secret. So my presentation today will be on trade secrets. I can't give you legal advice about it because I don't know the facts about your case or your company, but what I can do today is give you some guidelines and that will help you to recognize trade secrets in your company. And, uh, oh, technical difficulties. It's okay, I'm still on my starting slide anyways. Uh, but I think that um, the presentation will help you, give you guidelines, give you suggestions to better recognize, better protect, and better enforce your uh, trade secrets. Uh, I'm gonna guess and make it my premise is that all startups have some form of IP. You just might not know it. Um, and so part of the efforts this week has been to educate uh, startups and owners and uh, people that are interested in what IP is. So that can include your patents, which cover inventions. Trademarks cover your words and logos that distinguish you from your competitor. Uh, you may have original media that you use, which could be videos, uh, graphics, uh, publications. All that is kind of what I would think of as the traditional types of IP. But there's another, um, there's another mysterious and lurking type of IP, and that is uh, your trade secrets. And I, I describe them as mysterious and, and lurking because you don't always know that they're there. Um, you can look at your competitors and you can say, what are they doing that is better than me? And they're not going to tell you because they may have a trade secret. You also may have valuable business information that could be eligible for trade secret protection and you may not know it. So we're going to try to tackle some of those mysterious and lurking aspects of this intellectual property. And so I'll describe a couple of the uh, advantages first. Uh, one is that trade secrets can be powerful. They can cover different types of information. They can cover financial information that you have that you want to keep secret. They can cover potentially undisclosed inventions. 
Uh, and so you'll see in a minute, we'll kind of go through some of the types of information that can be protected. Uh, but it can cover a lot of different types. And so uh, you'll have to kind of go through that process in your own company of recognizing that information. Uh, another aspect of trade secrets is that nobody knows what they are. Nobody knows that they're there. And so competitors looking at you can say, well, what are they doing so great? And they may not know. And so there's value in that, and there's value in protecting that. The other thing is that a trade secret, unlike a patent or even a, a copyright, uh, has no definite lifespan. It can go on as long as you keep it secret. Uh, trade secrets can be cost efficient. There's no formal filing costs. A patent has to be registered. A trademark can be registered, but those cost attorney fees and filing fees. Um, so they're more cost efficient. They're not free because you have to pay for the cost to maintain them. So we'll cover some of those kind of procedures that you can go through to maintain them, but recognize that they, they can be a more, uh, they can be a cheaper form of protecting your valuable business information. Uh, second is that they're enforceable. Uh, both, there's both state and very soon to be enhanced federal laws that will help you to protect uh, the, from the misappropriation or stealing of your trade secrets. Uh, and finally, you know who knows. And what that means is that if you're protecting your trade secrets properly, you know exactly who has your information and you know exactly who can leave the company, for example, and go somewhere else with it. So it, it's, a, it's an advantage to you. It's a, it's a way of helping enforcing it and also deterring people from misappropriating that you know who knows the information that you're trying to protect. So I'm going to kind of take you through a kind of a qualitative uh, description of a trade secret first, and then we'll kind of get into more specifics. And this will help you to kind of understand what a trade secret is. So you can think of trade secrets as what, what you would put in your corporate diary. So we all may have personal diaries, but in your corporate diary, you may have um, information that keeps your business competitive, for example. That might be your secret sauce, your processes, your software code. Uh, but it also might be corporate wisdom. And what that is, is that you know all the scars and wounds of your company, all the things that you've done and failed to do, that's all your corporate wisdom. And that is, that can be described as negative know-how. It's like what you've done and what you won't do. And that can be, that compilation of information can be valuable and worthy of protection. So uh, trade secrets can create leverage against your competitors, but they can also, what I, what I call, uh, create a captivating impression with your customers, meaning that they'll see something about your company that they can't put their finger on, which is good because it's a trade secret, but they'll know that you have an advantage over your competitor. And so let's talk about what a trade secret is. And what I'm quoting here is a, this is more quantitative now, uh, aspect is I'm quoting the uh, trade secret statute in Texas. And so a trade secret is information and it can include, uh, I'll just read real quick, formula, pattern, compilation, program, device, method, technique, uh, process, financial data, and list of actual or potential customers or suppliers. Now, um, the uh, kind of the uniform definition that has been adopted by most states uh, this is kind of a variation of it. And one thing that is added here, a couple of things to this list, is financial data and a list of actual or potential customers and suppliers. And what that signals to us from the legislature of Texas is that they recognize that information that's protectable by trade secret can be a lot of things. You know, they're trying to cover as many things as possible. But don't sell your company short. Don't sell the information you have short by saying, well, it's not one of these, so maybe I can't protect it. So I don't care if I disclose it or not. Well, I think it's important to kind of sit down and, and understand that information that is valuable, gives you competitive advantage, could potentially be a trade secret. And there's a couple of under the A and B up here. I know it's a long quote, but uh, those are a couple other requirements. We'll talk about those in a second. So just a real quick listing of what could be a trade secret in your company. Again, I don't know the facts of your company, but uh, just kind of something I've kind of put together and just kind of thinking. Uh, software code, if you have an app, 
that does a special process. It may not be patentable necessarily, but it could be something that uh, gives you a more efficient execution, uh, that uh, provides information faster. Uh, it could be potentially a trade secret. Undisclosed inventions, uh, part of the process of, of getting a patent might be think, to think about whether or not it's worth it to get that patent, it's worth it to pursue that patent. Um, inventions that are unpatentable, because you've heard it from your patent attorney, or, because, or inventions that are questionably patentable, could potentially be held as trade secrets instead of pursuing the patent uh, road. And, and, and they're also, those roads are overlapping. So again, you know, depending on the facts of your case, uh, you could do both. Marketing plans, customer and potential customers. Again, when you start compiling lists that are, that are customized and tailored and you put a lot of sweat equity into those lists, that may, even though people, even though your customer might be visible on the street, your competitors may not know that your customers are comprised of this very special, highly refined list. So that very special, highly refined list could be a trade secret. And I put a couple of other examples. I put social media because I had a, I had a case where somebody, you know, wanted to uh, protect their social media contacts. So, you know, you kind of go through all of that, all of the, the process of saying, well, is this really a secret? Or is it a highly refined list that you've spent a lot of time that isn't readily ascertainable otherwise? So it really depends on a lot of things. But what I want to get out of you guys is to kind of think about, you know, oh, is that something that I can protect? Because that'll help you in the future and kind of bring that trade secret protection into your company. So one thing about trade secrets to remember, and one of the requirements is that it has value. It can't be something suggest subjective to just you, like a sentimental value or something, even if it is secret. It has to have some value in it. More importantly, information is a trade secret when the information is valuable to your competitors. That's probably the best type, because that shows that they want it. And the fact that they would want it if they knew about it, the, the fact that they want it if they knew about it, uh, instills that inherent value, and that's something that you can go to a, if you can document that, you can go to a court and show them that if you ever need to enforce that trade secret. Uh, I, I gathered these because I, I thought it was a good counterpoint to some of the stuff I'm saying, and that's that a trade secret can be good marketing. So telling people that you have a secret can be a good marketing plot. You'll notice that the examples I put up here are uh, food products. I think that inherently lends itself, when you have a food product and no one knows what's in it or how it's made, it lends itself for people to want to figure out what's in it. So it can be a good marketing ploy to tell people, we have something you don't. But I think it can be more valuable to say nothing. You know, It can be a trade secret. A trade secret can be the fact that you have a trade secret. So that can be another important thing when dealing with your company and controlling information in your company. You must decide early. You must decide, first of all, and then you must decide early. Uh, we talked about patents. Uh, some of the requirements of patents are that you be diligent in pursuing your, your, or filing your patent application. And also, currently under our law, we are under a first to file system. So if someone else independently comes up with your invention and then files, they are the inventor. They, are the, they have the priority over you, even though you may have invented that earlier. So decide early. Uh, another reason to decide early is that the risk of disclosure is very high. Information is, I don't know, what is information? It's stuff in your mind or stuff on paper or, you know, it can be very easily disclosed inadvertently. So I just listed some of the, some of the channels for where the risk of disclosure could be high, storing the information when the information is on your computer, when the information is on your cell phone or your employee's cell phone, uh, when the information is exchanged perhaps during when you're raising capital, when you're talking to investors or even potential investors, collaborating with others, startups. Uh, what I appreciate about startups is that they want to collaborate with other people, make a team, make it uh, more efficient, um, you know, the strength is in the numbers, but you have to be very careful about how you're disclosing information when 
uh, when you are collaborating. And then you'll see that there's kind of a, a hierarchy. There's going to be the insiders, who are kind of your corporate executives, your partners, the people that you're working with who, who are privy to the information, the trade secret information. And then there's employees, and then there's your vendors and your suppliers and your retailers and your customers. And so they, they become more of the outsiders. So you need to be able to define who's the insider, who's the outsider. And then finally, one important point is your bragging. We all want to go to happy hour in half an hour and talk about how great our company is. But don't tell them why it's so great in terms of the trade secret, you know, in terms of your corporate information. So what? So, so far, we've talked about how trade secrets are powerful, cost-efficient, enforceable, but you must decide early on to seek that trade secret protection. Otherwise, you may get an unwanted disclosure. And disclosure, it can, it might, it probably will kill your trade secret. I would say it will kill it just to be on the safe side, so don't do it. So where do you start up? What I wanted to do was just present a real quick uh, guideline for um, kind of giving you a step process to protecting your trade secrets. First of all, secure them. And this is important because you can do this like today or tomorrow. You can gather your team together and sit down with a pad and paper or a computer and start identifying what brings value to your company. You know, what is, brings you the competitive advantage and seeing if that's something that is potentially, if, if you can keep that secret. Is that something that you can keep from your competitors, that you can kind of partition out from your employees and just keep it as part of the core assets of your company? And then also formulate a strategy to maintain secrecy. So formulating a strategy, I would say, means addressing the risks. So what I did was I took the list that I had earlier about storing information and I said, well, how do you address that risk? Well, you start using your internal data controls, firewalls, passwords. Uh, you start using more centralized data storage so that the data doesn't reside on any device that's apart from your facilities. Having control over who, what, what devices can access and who can access. And then just plain old marking your documents. So if you have a, mem a memo or a letter or even a printed email, you don't put top secret on it, but you put trade secret you know, put something on it that marks it. That way people who see it, who are, who are not eyes only, will say, okay, I'm not supposed to be reading this document or taking it home or making photocopies of it. That can help, that can help preserve evidence that, or later that, that you actually did take proper measures. Raising capital, collaborating with others, working with employees and contractors, all of these have something in common. These are people that you can enter into agreements with, written agreements, that control how the information is used by that other party. So you can set the scope of what they can do. You can say what they can't do, for example, reverse engineering. Uh, and you can also, uh, one other suggestion too, is to define what the trade secret is. You don't have to disclose it necessarily in the document. Every case is different. But you can identify the trade secret about the app called blah, blah, blah. That way, when you go to enforce it or when the other party goes to uh, to think about whether they whether they can disclose it, they'll read they'll read the document. And see, it says this. It says this is what the trade secret is. I cannot disclose this. And then I, the other category of people I would say are vendors, suppliers, and marketing, and then your family and friends. They're all on a do not need to know basis, you know. So do not tell them because if you tell them, then you weaken the trade secret protection, you create evidence that you didn't intend to really protect it that well, and that creates evidence for another party to say, hey, they weren't really that careful, they never intended to, to uh, take that. Go ahead, I have a question. NDAs? Okay, the question was, and tell me if I'm wrong, uh, the question was, at what point should we uh, start asking for NDAs? Uh, I, I would say, you know, once you've gone through this kind of process of, of identifying what your trade secret is, 
whenever you're dealing with a third party who isn't under, already under some obligation to keep it secret, they need to have some understanding of, of, of keeping it secret, and that needs to be documented. So that needs to come preferably in the form of an NDA that sets out the exact terms. So the first thing you can do that's probably the best thing is if they don't need to know, you don't tell them. So you don't need to tell someone who doesn't need to know that they need to sign an NDA because you're just not going to tell them. But if it's somebody who's like an investor or potential investor, you can either describe it in a way that doesn't disclose it and say, well, I have, I have other information, I have other technology that I can't disclose to you, but this is the value of my company and this is the advantages. And then if they want to pursue that more, then, then that's when you tell them, well, if you want to know what my secret sauce is, I need to protect it as a trade secret. And the more informed and the more, um, the more informed you sound to that other person, the more they will appreciate that, yeah, okay. Because if they're going to be an investor or someone's trying to help you, they don't want to ruin the secrecy by hearing what you have to say when you don't have the proper protections. You don't sound sophisticated enough. You don't sound sophisticated enough to run a business. So informing yourself and informing them about that is kind of a good time. And so the best time is when you're going to disclose it under the right conditions. I mentioned this earlier, reverse engineering. Just know that um, if someone, a third party that isn't part of your group, if they can go off and reverse engineer it, meaning get access to it, then you really don't have a trade secret. So uh, that's, that's going to be part of your process in the beginning when you sit down and, and talk about what valuable information you have. Another question to ask is, can this be reverse engineered? easily or readily, because that's kind of the, the standard. So, it, you know, if it's something that can only be discovered by stealing your documents or by getting access to your servers or something like that, um, then that's not readily ascertainable. It's really actually ascertainable by improper means. And also know that you can, you can engage in license agreements with your own employees or other people to prohibit them from reverse engineering. So you can actually write that into a document and tell them, hey, you, you can't just go home with this and figure it out on your own and say that you were just doing an independent project on your own. You can tell them, no, you are prohibited from reverse engineering this process. So maintain, keep it secret. We talked about some of these, but one of the more important ones is to document what you're doing. So make it part of your process. And I know a lot of you guys are maybe the smaller companies, you know, small that, you know, you don't have a secretary, that you're going to tell to go document this. But you could still keep kind of that corporate diary, that journal that says, today um, we had a meeting, we talked about trade secrets, today we set up passwords, all this stuff, because you're creating evidence for a later time period where if you ever have to enforce that, that you, you can take that to the court and you can tell them, this is what we did. And another important thing is review and update periodically. So on a daily basis, not daily, I'm sorry, not daily, on a, a periodic basis, maybe every six months, every year, just depending on how your, how your company is changing, you need to update your procedures. You need to update your policies. You need to review if you're doing enough. And uh, ultimately what you want to do is create a trade secret culture. You want to create an environment where everybody on your team knows where you're going with the information and knows that it has to stay within the team, that they're not going to the happy hour and bragging about it and talking about it. They're not going to potential investors and just disclosing it uh, unilaterally without telling you. That kind of stuff is very important. So that corporate communication, co corporate understanding that the trade secret has a value, but it's only valuable as long as it's a secret. Protect, be vigilant with secrecy. That's kind of a duh, but it's also on a day-to-day -day basis, you kind of forget. I mean, you have other things to do. You have your company to make successful. You don't want to necessarily do all of this, but it's important because, first of all, when you let the cat out of the bag, it's out and it puts on glasses. But also, when you really need trade secret protection, 
you're going to need it today. You're going to need to know what you did. You're going to need all your documents together today because if you have an employee or, or a partner who, who is disgruntled and wants to go make his own business and thinks he owns those trade secrets and really it's the property of the LLC that you guys created, then you're going to have to go to the court and seek an injunction. And in order to do that, you're going to have to prove to the judge that you have a very reasonable likelihood that you're going to succeed on the merits. And in order to do that, you're going to show, have to show them that you actually kept it as a trade secret. So be vigilant. Another mantra for today is loose lips sink ships. Not just might. Uh, I am done with my presentation. Um, but I'm going to take some questions. Uh, I also did a, I have a bowl here if anybody wants to give me their cards. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a drawing for a $20 Torchy, Torchy's gift card. I don't know if you guys know Torchy's, but they're pretty good tacos. Okay, so the question was that we have um, software and electronics companies. Higher concentration here at Startup Week. And okay, so uh, um, in a lot of these processes, it just really depends. Um, software is going to be the, probably the biggest one because a lot of them depend on software. Um, they're services companies. But also a lot of them, I went to the growth hacking, and there's a lot of uh, marketing processes that you'll see, because a lot of them depend on internet and online. Uh, and some of the techniques are already known techniques, but, but what I saw in those presentations is that they, they hone in on their target audience. They hone in on certain um, either geographies or, or areas of the internet where they can find their customers, and then they repeat, repeat, repeat. So that to me is, and one of the examples at this growth hacking was a lawn lawn company. So you can do lawns well, but if you market your lawn services better, you can beat the guy who does the lawns just as well as you because you're doing it better. So that in and of itself can be a trade secret. So marketing, software, uh, with electronics, it could be a process that you're using um, to it's in manufacturing, for example, uh, if you're manufacturing a, a physical product. Okay, so the, oh. yeah, you're asking if you went onto the internet and pulled off an NDA from there, would that be enforceable? Um, okay, so what you're, what you're saying is that you would take a written agreement and kind of put your name in there and then have the other party sign it. So it would be enforceable on the terms that are written in the NDA, uh, assuming that there's nothing that makes it completely unenforceable. <laughs> The answer is the answer is yes. Um, many NDAs have fairly typical provisions, but you kind of need to know what your needs are. So, for example, defining what the trade secret is, you need to be able to sit down, maybe with an attorney, probably with an attorney, and to sit down and say, "Hey, how can I phrase this so that it's it's not just enforceable, but enforceable specifically on my uh, on on my issues." Um, you want to be able to put in uh, certain restrictions on what they can do, like the scope of their use. Uh, oftentimes, uh, they may th the other side may think, well, that's just too restrictive. So they'll send it back to you and they'll mark it up. So then you're like, well, I don't even know the difference between what they marked up and what I, you know. So a lot of those, that's what makes it more tailor-made. Um, you know, there's some boilerplate to it in a sense, but there's also a lot of uh, just kind of fine-tuning. And one thing about that, too, is that you can create a document that is tailor-made for a category of people. So you don't have to do it every time you have, let's say you have a, a supplier that somehow interacts with your information that you want to keep secret. 
you can define that information to the supplier and every other supplier more or less will have the same agreement, you know, just depending on the facts. But that way you're not spending, you know, money every time you're executing a document. So there is some efficiency to that. Okay, so when you're dealing with, um, you know, instant messaging, uh, it's good to take a look at the terms of the user terms because, you know, are, do you own your posts, for example? Do you own the content of your posts? If you don't, um, and if you're potentially other people can join in with you, make friends with you or LinkedIn or whatever, then you're decreasing the secrecy of, of what you're doing. So if you know you're gonna talk about proprietary information that, that you, you know, there's a difference. There's proprietary information, there's just stuff that's confidential, like if you and me have a private talk. We may not exchange a, a trade secret, you know, it might be private, but it's, it may not be a trade secret. It may just be something I don't want people to know outside of you and me. So, but a trade secret, has an, another independent value besides its confidentiality. It has the value of being uh, competitive with uh, your, uh, being leveraged against your competitors. So you kind of have to kind of separate those avenues because, it, you know, if it's, if it's got the value and it's a trade secret, then maybe more secure ways of communicating are the best way to do it. Um, because you're, you're really devaluing or degrading the value of the secret because you're you're putting it in avenues that have a questionable secrecy. They're not as like going into a private room and talking with somebody. You're really going and shouting across the, shouting across the way. So that's kind of a more of a overall view of it. I know you had a lot of questions in there. Um, Well, okay, so you would have an, um, a, a contract that, you know, if it was for me, I, I mean, if it was mine, I, I might say, well, you need to have a contract that has provisions that make it enforceable under U.S. law. So that way you kind of get some of that ability to use U.S. law to hold them to their agreement. Now, you may want to have the ability to pursue them in another country, which, you know, it may be questionable whether, you know, the contracting is going to bring you into the U.S. So you may want to have an agreement that is also enforceable in the other country that you can, so that, that'll depend country by country because different countries have different um, requirements and whether they'll enforce a, an agreement. So it's really a very, that's, that's another tailored 
That's a very highly tailored. So patents are, uh, you know, patents require a filing. So that a trade secret actually has no formal filing requirements. So y what you can do is you can, um, you can make documentation, but there's not going to be a formal filing where you submit your trade secret into a governmental agency and tell them, you know, it's really about, it's more contractual, it's more the statutory law. There may be individual statutory laws in those other countries that protect disclosures but you'll have to investigate each one separately. So it's not like the patent system that has a filing system that, that affords protections in that way. It's really more up to, to the owners of the trade secret information to maintain the status of it. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so your question was, when do we need to start thinking about trade secrets? Okay. No, that's a really good question because, um, you know, when you're developing a product in the early stages, you don't necessarily know what you have. So you kind of have to be a little more vigilant about it, but what you're going to identify even early on is you're going to identify the, the core process or the core technology, I'll call it technology, but um, it sounds like you're thinking of maybe a software product. And so when you have a software product, you can, you make flow charts. For example, when we file patent applications for uh, software related inventions, we, we think, the first thing I ask is, you know, get me a flow chart because I want to see what are those processes? Because I'm going to want to claim something in that process as a patentable. But even if it isn't patentable, you may have a process that you think, well, these are the steps that we're doing that's beating our competition. That, those steps right there and the steps that evolve from it or, or are updated from it, that's where you want to think about um, protecting that as your trade secret. So again, when you go to your investors, they may say, well, I don't want to sign any NDA, you know, I don't want to sign it because it just gets in my way, brings liability on me, and that's goes to part, partly goes to the, some of the tailoring you have to do, you know, kind of limiting liability just enough for the investors. But at the same time, you don't have to, when you know what your core trade secret is, then when you go to your investors, you can, you don't have to tell them what it is. You can tell them, this is what my, my product does, it does it faster, these are the outputs, Show them outputs. That's not a trade secret. It's what everybody sees. So show them the outputs. And then it becomes a negotiation. It becomes, okay, so you're interested. Okay, so now you're a little more interested. And then when you get them more involved, that's when you say, okay, if we're going to talk on the core level of what this is, you're asking me to give you my property. And that property cannot be given to you unless there is an NDA. And that's kind of, I mean, that's kind of the process. I know it's tough because you're dealing with people who have your money and you want them to like you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I work with startups. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not young, but I'm not old. So I've never called them startups. I've always just said small businesses because, you know, and I also call them solo inventors because I'm a patent lawyer. So. Uh, you know, there are people who, who have an asset, like a, like a patent, and they, they want to create a business around it. And so those are the types of businesses that I've worked with. Any questions? Uh, we're going to have our drawing. 
So if anybody else has a card. So you got two, you got two choices. First, first prize gets a Torchy's Taco gift card, 20 bucks. Second, or if you want, instead of the gift card, you can get two Benavides Law can coolers. And you got permission to use Better, you're encouraged to use these at the house. Uh, okay, so there's only a few cards in here, so. Kimmy, Kimmy Barrett. Hey, Kimmy. I won't be upset if you pick the gift card. Uh, okay, I like Yeah, good. She got the money. Okay, and second place, runner up, which I think is the better prize, goes to Sahel Taylor. Congratulations. Thank you. And that, that concludes my presentation. If you have any more questions, uh, you can always catch me on social media. I have, I have cards here if you want on my card. Um, or you can email me. I have a blog. Um, or call me. And I, I appreciate your time and uh, have a good rest of the week. Thank you.